It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For today's video, I'm gonna respond to a person that's like a right-wing conservative yet again about the topic about religion. Now, the last video I did about this particular topic was actually aimed towards gothics. And the main reason why I made the video against gothics is not necessarily because she is religious, but more so because she spread hateful rhetoric against atheists. And for this video, it seems as though that the content creator that I'm responding to is spreading really hateful things against gay people. And so again, this video is not attacking anybody because they're religious, it's attacking this particular individual because of the rhetoric that she used. To give you guys context about what happened is that a church in Massachusetts was struck down by lightning and engulfed in flames. This content creator is known as Melody Mack, and she says in response to the church being burned down, Blasphemous Church Go Boom! She also did an announcement that she made a whole entire video about this particular incident. She continues to say, I only listen to what Jesus said and not the rest of the Bible. Jesus said, He and the Father are one. You're wasting your time, if you will, not honor the Word of God. May as well quit the LARPing if you're only going to halfway do it. When I saw this post for the first time, my first reaction is that this type of zealotry is probably the main reason why no one likes Christianity anymore. Now, according to the data that's been done by Pew Research Center, that by 2070, about 46% of Americans will identify as a Christian, but will no longer be a majority. In this scenario, the share of nuns will reach as high as 41%, and the other remaining groups will make us 13%. I'm gonna to respond to her post in two separate ways. The first way is a theological point of view, and the second way is a scientific point of view. Now, there are two ways to actually interpret the Bible. The first way is energesis, and the second way is exergesis. Now, these two concepts refer to the idea that people can impose their own personal views on the text, even though it's not necessarily in the text, and the other idea refers to the notion of letting the text speak for itself. Now the main reason why many Christians are Trinitarians today is something that is known as the Council of Nicaea, which took place roughly around 329 BCE. Back then, there were many Christians that had conflicting views with each other, when it came down to the idea of the divinity of Christ, there are some Christians that thought that Jesus was divine, but it's not necessarily God. There were some Christians like the Gnostics who also thought that God were evil. And so there were also some Christians who also thought that Jesus and God are one and the same. And so they were debating among theologians as organized by Constantine to figure out what exactly is the truth when it comes down to this whole entire matter. Now keep in mind, the bulk, if not the vast majority of the Old Testament was written down in different time periods before the very idea of the Trinity even existed. In the first five books of Genesis alone, we have something that is known as the Documentary Hypothesis, which identifies various writing styles and philosophies that many of the writers use. For example, we have the J source, we have the E source, we have the P source, and the D source. Now, the J source, like the Yahweh source, the E source, the Elohim source, the P source is the Priestly source, and the D source is actually the Deuteronomy source. And because the Bible does not necessarily operate underneath the idea of universal vocality, that will mean that the various books within the same book will often contradict each other in terms of the ideas, in terms of philosophy, and so on. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, it says that the father should not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children should be put to death for the fathers, every man shall be put to death for his own son. Now, most Christian denominations rest on the idea that Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father to forgive the sins of all the world. Well, it turns out that this verse that I used for Deuteronomy completely contradicts the idea that they actually claim. Another example of this is Psalm chapter 49, verse 7 to 9, where it says that no one can redeem the life of another or give God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly, no payment is ever enough. So they should be lived on forever and not see the cry. 
again, is saying that the God of the Bible cannot necessarily sacrifice his own people for salvation, but he does it anyway. <laughs> John chapter 14 verse 28 says, You heard me say, I'm going to go and coming back for you. If you love me, you will be glad that I'm going to be the Father, for the Father is greater than I am. In that particular context, Jesus Christ is not necessarily saying that he's actually God. He is saying that there's actually something that's higher than he is. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, it says right here that the most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Suggesting that the God is only one person and not part of Jesus. Now in John chapter 20 verse 17, Jesus says, Do not hold unto me, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am sitting to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. John chapter 14 verse 1, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Again, suggesting that the God, the Bible, and Jesus are separate entities. John chapter 6 verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Again, suggesting that Jesus and God are separate things. Now, her argumentation is that John chapter 10 verse 30 says that I and the Father are the same. However, it's not necessarily referring to her trinity in the slightest. Now, from biblicalunitarian.com, it says right here, that Christ uses the concept of being one in other places, and from then one can see one purpose is what it meant. For example, in John 11:52, it says that Jesus was to die to be make all God's children one. And John chapter 17, verse 11, 21, and 22, Jesus prayed that God to his followers would be one, and he and God were one. We think it's obvious that Jesus was not praying to his followers to be one being or one substance, just as he and the Father were being one or substance. We believe the meaning is clear. Jesus was praying that his followers would be one in purpose, just as he and God were one in purpose. Additionally, the word Trinity just simply does not exist in the Bible. Now, many Christians or Trinitarians will argue that Genesis chapter 1 verse 25 is a direct reference to a trinity. However, historically speaking, that's not necessarily the case because Genesis chapter 1 verse 25 is a direct reference to polytheism, specifically polytheism and the ancient Canaanite religions. And so there's no sort of trinity within that text either because the trinity was actually developed in 325 BCE and the book of Genesis was written down roughly around 1400 BCE. Although the trinity does not necessarily exist anywhere in the Bible, let's just pretend for the sake of argumentation that the trinity does in fact exist. Now the main reason why so many Christians are against gay people is because of verses in the Old Testament. Now the main reason why so many conservative Christians are against homosexuals is because of Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 where it says, If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them has done a detestable thing. But here's the thing, it's not necessarily referring to gay people either. Now it says right here, Anyway, I had a German friend come back to town, and I asked if he could help me with some passages in one of my German Bibles from the 1800s. So we went to Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22, and he's translating it for me word by word. And the English where it says, Man should not be alive with a man is an abomination. The German version says, Man should not lie with young boys as he does with a woman, for it's an abomination. I said, Are you sure? He said, yes. So he went to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. Same thing, young boys. So I went to 1 Corinthians to see how they translated the word. And instead of homosexuals, it said boy molesters will inherit the kingdom of God. So even if we were to grant that the Trinity is actually in the Bible, it's actually referring to boy molesters or pedophiles. It's not necessarily referring to homosexuals. Now also please point out a verse to me where it uses the word homosexual for Sodom and Gomorrah. Because I looked and I looked and I looked and there's no such verse 
in direct reference to homosexuals or the word homosexual actually exists. So it seems as though that you're superimposing your view about homosexuals in the text about Sodom and Gomorrah. Now let's use a much more psychoanalytical point of view because he truly believes that the main reason why the church in Massachusetts was burnt down by lightning is because of the God of the Bible. Now this sort of idea, this agency that we had to put onto nature is as old as time because it seems as though that we project our own personal feelings, our personal desires into things that might not be there, but we add characteristics to actually reflect us. So if someone was truly anti-gay, that would mean that their personal idea of their God would also be very much anti-gay. If someone has no problem with homosexual, that would mean that their particular ideas of God would not be against homosexuals. This type of primitive behavior that she's actually displaying for this case is very resemblance to the idea of a kid being scared of like, you know, the boogeyman or somebody thinks that something moved because of a ghost. It's kind of like the same as Alex Sting, but for like grown adults. This whole entire line of argumentation also opens the idea of Pedora's box because essentially, of course, there are many pedophile priests across many churches by the millions at this point, and not a single time that a supposedly this God used lightning to strike people down. But when it comes down to a church that has gay people inside, that's when the lightning starts to strike down? She is basically saying that, of course, the God of the Bible cares more about the actions of gay people than actual pedal priests are raping little kids. I'm just, I'm just amazed by that. At any rate, her tweet is very sadistic, is very superstitious, is very primitive, and it's completely backwards. But what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I won't <laughs> trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.